In this example, the top figure we are showing has an input and output register being used. As you know, the IOBs, or the IO blocks, have dedicated registers which provide a fixed input and a fixed output time. These registers are the fastest way to clock data into or out of the FPGA. Timing is simpler because, of course, it's block routing is fixed, and it's easier to predict and control. If you do not use these registers, you end up wasting them. The timing of the IOB registers is fixed and quoted in the data book because there are no programmable routing resources associated within the IOB. You should also know that the DLL, that is the Digital Clock Manager resources, compensates for the clock propagation delay, which improves your I.O. timing. All Xilinx devices are equipped with delay lock loops, or DLLs, or Digital Clock Managers, which enable the clock inputs to the device to be conditioned. Although they can be used to multiply the clock frequency and generate multiple clock phases, the most fundamental reason for using them should be to obtain deterministic input and output timing of the device. Make sure you use the DLL to compensate for your clock delay. In this last case, the lower diagram shows the IOB flip-flops not being used. The lower figure will require longer setup and clock to output times, since general interconnect will be needed to get the signals to and from the IOBs. Likewise, since we are using general interconnect to route the signals to the registers, the timing will be less predictable. Now, synthesis tools will infer an input IOB flip-flop when a register is inferred if it is directly connected to an input pin and has a fan unit of 1. Likewise, if an output flip-flop is inferred and it has an output of 1 and is directly connected to an output pin, the IOB flip-flop will be used as well. Be sure to double check with your synthesis tools schematic viewer that the IOB flip-flops are being used in your design. This slide is reminding you that the slice registers share clocks, clock enables, reset, and set signals. This is important if you want to maximize the number of registers used in your design. You can't just pack any two flip-flops into the same slice for this reason. To improve your device utilization and give the tools the most flexibility to meet your timing needs, we recommend that you reduce the number of clocks in your design and use only one edge of the clock, if possible. Note that the use of the associated set, reset, and clock enable signals with each slice is optional, but the clock signal is not optional. So our best recommendation is to try to reduce the number of clocks in your design so you can improve your device utilization. In this example, we have built a ripple counter, and we want to ask you a couple of questions. What would be the effect of implementing a ripple counter inside of your FPGA? And how many slices do you think this would require? So go ahead and think about this situation a little bit and see if you can determine what is wrong with building a ripple counter inside your FPGA. Well, as you can see, there are simply too many clocks in this design. This would require too many global buffers if you are planning on writing these clocks on the global routing resources. If a customer insisted on doing this, they would probably route the lowest fan-out clocks on general interconnect. Since the fan-out was very low, this would be strongly recommended. But note that either way, none of the flip-flops can be placed into the same slice because the flip-flops don't share the same clock. This would force a poor mapping and waste resources. This may not kill the performance entirely, but it would require you to waste a bunch of half slices. So here is another realistic question. In this design, you're using a simple synchronous reset with a counter. How will your counter implementation be affected if the design also includes a global asynchronous reset signal? So pause the recording and go ahead and think about that a minute. And in particular, what we're looking at is, how do you think this would map the various control signals to the lookup tables? Remember that because you are now using a global asynchronous reset, the flip-flops will be connected to the global reset, and a LUT input will be used for the local synchronous reset in this design. This is because the Xilinx Unified Library requires all control ports on a flip-flop to be synchronous or asynchronous, and there's only one reset port on the flip-flop. Since the global reset is asynchronous, this forces all the flip-flops attached to the global reset to be asynchronous. 
This will also make the global reset a high fanout net that is routed on general interconnect and that will result in it having a long routing delay. And hopefully we won't have a routing problem or for that matter hopefully we won't have a timing problem. The synchronous reset will now be connected to a LUT input and this will force a second high fanout net to be routed as well as each LUT will lose one input. Try to remember that it's not just the fact you are wasting LUT inputs with a global reset, but that local resets will have to be routed on general interconnect as well, which can be difficult to meet timing. In this example, we also used an additional LUT for the inversion of the synchronous reset and its insertion on the carry chain. This is not a big problem, but does add some delay to the carry chain. With the current polarity of the synchronous reset, the inverter is needed. The inverter could be avoided if the synchronous reset was defined as active low in the code, but this would still not avoid the new critical path completely. So you may not even want to worry about that bit too much. So overall, this design will use more power because the design now routes a global reset net and uses more logic than it might otherwise. Timing may also be harder to meet since the routing in this region is now going to be heavier. So as you probably know by now, Global resets are not helpful to getting speed and improving device utilization. Just something to think about. In this example, we built a loadable up-down counter. While this is not difficult to build, you should consider any special connections associated with it. In this case, during a load operation, you have to ignore the feedback of the queue. This means that it has to use an input to the LUT. However, you also have to prevent the feedback from getting back into the carry chain, which is how the MULT AND gate helps you out. This allows the count load signal to turn off the feedback of Q when loading in a new value. The inverter is required because during a load operation, you must prevent the original Q value from being passed back into the carry logic. But to drive the MULT AND correctly, you must put a zero on the MULT AND input when you're loading. To count up and down is the same as adding or subtracting. The key thing to note here is that as your counter gets more functionality, it tends to use more LUT inputs. Now, take this example and in your mind imagine adding a global asynchronous reset and a local reset to the design. And you see that you will quickly add another level of logic and ruin the chance to build a fast counter. So kind of keep this in mind. So here is a summary of some of the coding tips we provided you so far. Take advantage of the ILB resources available to you with the Spartan 3 FPGA. Try to register all of your I.O. And remember that you waste the flip-flops in the ILBs when you don't use them. Do not build ripple counters in FPGAs. Again, they tend to use too many clocks, and those clocks get routed on general interconnect. So you can create some problems that way. Avoid global resets. If you can't avoid a global asynchronous reset, be aware that also using local synchronous resets will end up using more LUTs. So try to manage your overall control signal usage. Local synchronous resets create a high fanout net, which might create timing problems when there is also a global asynchronous reset. Consider the number of inputs in any special connection, such as a load, that's necessary for more complex functions they do impact your device utilization because they suck up your LUT inputs. Memory is the most fundamental feature of modern FPGAs and is a key element in managing your device cost. It is important to observe the ratio of dedicated memory to logic elements as well as the trend to increase the total quantity of block RAM available. A good FPGA designer must learn how to use and not waste block RAM resources. This slide is logarithmic. So the larger devices are really much larger than they appear here. When you move to a smaller device, the memory to logic ratio increases, so you need to try to use the block RAMs to save the slice resources. All cost reductions require either removing functionality or optimizing the design and using a smaller device. If you move to a smaller device, the memory to logic ratio increases so you're probably going to need to be very interested in techniques that use memory to reduce logic requirements. And that's what we're kind of trying to hope to get into in the next few slides.